Great. So we have a fireside chat now with Dr. David Fine, without any fire, but with all of the, all of the energy of fire, I certainly hope. And Dr. Fine, again, David, thank you for your immense contribution to enable much of this to happen. I think that your, your generosity has, has created the opportunity for the WIC. And so I guess I wanted to start off the fireside chat by asking you what your intention and thinking was when you did this for Wits University and, and what you hope to see out of it. I came to Woods in 1960, left in 64, uh, in the peak of apartheid, and my family was involved in the, in the apartheid movement, and I, I had to leave, there was no future, particularly for someone in the sciences at that time. And I wanted to pay something back to, uh, to the university. That's one reason. Another reason is I thought of, I'm very much involved in innovation, and I thought, gee, how can I make a contribution to understanding innovation and contributing to innovation? And the large American universities, the large American universities have vast uh, funds to, uh, fr from um, past uh, uh, members of their community. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity to try and start the same thing with words, make a contribution and get other people to, to follow, follow suit. An another interest in mine is what makes one person innovate and another person not innovate? And the only way to really understand that is to put that into a university environment where you're not only are you funding innovation, but you're also trying to fund why people innovate. What, make, what part of their personality makes that do doable and can we extend that so that many, many people can innovate? As children, we all innovate kids in a sandbox are playing with blocks and they call them cars and they, they're all having fun innovating. Where is that stamped out of us? Is it at school? Is it uh, TV with telling us what to buy, what to think? Uh, and so, so, so some, there's a lot of that in there as well. And lastly, uh, funding innovation in South Africa at Woods, uh, the funds go a long way and it's desperately needed here. Uh, and th th these are the multiple reasons. That's appreciated. And I guess there's a, f there's a I appreciate the applause as well. <laughs> I guess there's a fascinating question that arises. It's almost an implicit mandate to us at the WIC to try to distill out what is the essence of innovation and innovators here at the university. And we have a number of them already and who we have the pleasure of working with and many of whom are around tonight. And I guess then the, the question that arises is, what do you think, it, from your extensive innovation and experience, it is that you expect we will see in innovators? And what has it been with you, either quiet or innate? I've thought about this, obviously, a lot. Uh, I've worked with very brilliant scientists, far brighter than myself, who learn an awful lot, very sharp, but they can't innovate. They can publish papers and they can do research, but a new idea doesn't come from them. And I found myself and people around me, it was the young scientists, people who were new to the field, who tended to be the innovators. Because they, as I mentioned uh, this afternoon, they, uh, they didn't know very much about it, so they were, had a lot of ideas, whereas the expert in the field uh, was stuck. He, he, he couldn't really, he or she couldn't really think through a problem because they knew everything about it and they couldn't find a solution. Whereas the younger innovator who doesn't know the field well can come in and say, oh, that's the solution. Uh, because they don't know any better. And, and, and that's so important to, uh, to give people the opportunity to, to think. And because uh, we, we're all thinkers, we, we, I mean, we innovate in the way we dress, the way we f cook our food. The, you know, why don't we do it in our, in, our, in, our, in our work? That is the question. And I, I guess it reminds me of this idea that you raised today in your, in your address at the, I think it was graduation two of three that Nithya officiated today, so amazing, <laughs> uh, where you said in particular that you tell people don't become the experts in a field if you want to innovate in that field because becoming the expert, as you're saying now, actually blocks you from innovating. So 
can you, can you share that idea? Because it's radical here at a university, right? And we need to hear this information at a university because we need to change our thinking if we are going to be truly innovative. I'm giving the, the same example I gave, I gave today. Um, I was at a lunch with a visitor and he mentioned um, the importance of carcinogenic in nitrosamines, certain compounds, and how it was very difficult to measure these. No one could do it. And, uh, but they were very important compounds because they may be involved in the etiology of human cancer. I didn't know anything about analytical chemistry. I didn't know anything about nitrosamines. I didn't even know what they were. It drew a formula, and they all had nitric oxide as part of the formula attached to nitrogen. And my thinking in total naivety was, oh, why don't we just heat it up a little bit? It'll give off NO, it'll measure the NO. When I tried that, it worked. And it took a while to get acceptance that it was working. But the, uh, the key then was that I asked the question, which is similar to what you're asking, is why didn't the experts gener uh, get the solution? And why did it take two years for them to even accept the solution? And the answer came from uh, Shunru Suzuki, a Buddhist monk, who I was, I was reading something about him. And he mentioned, you know, to the beginner's, uh, beginner's mind, there are many opportunities, many ideas. To the experts, there are very few. And uh, it made me realize that if you really become an expert in your field, yeah, you're an expert and you can make the next limited step, but you're not going to make the leaps because you're, 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 you know too much about it. And uh, therefore, the right way to uh, learn and solve a problem is to read about enough to understand it. Then stop. Very important to stop. Don't go and become an expert. Read a little bit. <laughs> then you'll have... And think about the solutions. Go away and write it all down. You'll have lots of solutions. Then complete your reading. Now you're going to have a lot of solutions and you're the expert. And that just changed my world completely. And I've used that to, to great advantage and I hope other people here in this audience will, will do the same thing. And then when I became an expert myself in, say, in nitrosamines or other fields, when I was really at the top of the field, I found it boring. I was no longer able to innovate. I was making little steps, not giant leaps. And I found it much more stimulating to look for something different to do, where I could be that, that young beginner again. <laughs> and, and this is what, what my whole career was. That's why I sort of changed around and did a lot, a lot of different things. And I think other people can, can do the same. It's very comfortable and easy to stay as the expert. Uh, but it's, it's a different way of life and you, you know, you don't, it's nothing you look forward to getting up in the morning. On the other hand, if you're in a new field, you, you've got all these potential solutions for a problem and you know, you, it's fun again. Absolutely. I think the, the learnings for us as a, a university is that, first of all, we might r change the way we do some PhD research projects in that, you know, our expectation is you go out and you read for many years and then you become proficient um, more than proficient in that field, and then you go and sort of push that boundary. And I think what we're learning here as an institution is that we know that idea that true innovation never really comes from the center of a field. It comes from the periphery, from where you can't see it. You know, it, it just suddenly comes in, probably from these sort of naive non-experts in a field. And what really excites us as the WIC is the opportunity then to take cross-disciplinary research because we have a wide range of cross-cutting concerns across our university. Take researchers who could be radically uncomfortable in a new environment like uh, Christo's amazing art and science uh, projects where artists are sitting in laboratories and then really get them to be innovative because they can suddenly radically push things. And we're going to try and embody that wisdom that you've just imparted here. Uh, and it, what it does take is that the person involved have a good scientific training, training in the methods, training in understanding science, uh, prove every step. But you can make leaps and then go back and fill them in. But you've got to make sure what you're doing is reproducible, that other people can copy it. Uh, 
and when people start swearing at you and saying you're uh, or calling you all sorts of names because what you're proposing is, to, to their minds, impossible, you've already pr proven it. And you've had someone, some of your colleagues have proven it. So you sit back and laugh at, at people uh, who crit is highly critical, but you know they're wrong. <laughs> so I guess in any organization, we have these, this immune system. Of whatever collective it is, it's an immune system of things that might try to destroy an idea. Or, or So what, if, we, if we were to try to understand that trait in you, that had, is it a resilience trait that allowed you to continue despite criticism from some of the experts in a field that you were about to disrupt? How does that work? I, I found I had proven something to work. Uh, let me give you an example was in the explosives area, explosive detection. We had developed a technique for measuring ex explosives. Uh, people in government thought it, didn't, it couldn't possibly work, but it was working very well. And so that one took a long time. It took like 20 years to really get full acceptance. But it was the knowledge that we were right because we had proven it and other people could duplicate it. And so, no, you couldn't continue to survive that way and you had to go into other fields and, and do things, but you knew you were right because it was the experiments that had been done, the data had been collected, other people around you had, had duplicated that. You've got to be damn sure you're right. You know, you don't want to, you've got to make sure your units are right, your measurements are right, your equipment's working right. But once you've done all that and other people can duplicate it, then you just sit back and enjoy the people who are screaming at you. <laughs> so you had this robustness because you had already shown yourself that this was true, possible. And, and, and this happened, in my career, it's happened to me many, many times. Uh, another important aspect of, of, and you brought it up a little bit, is different cultures, different disciplines working together are very, very important. Uh, in the U.S., at least in, in my work, a uh, South African, uh, someone from Germany, someone from the Soviet Union, from China, uh, totally different cultural backgrounds. We all think differently. And now if you add to that mix, not only are they all chemists, let's throw in a physicist, an accountant, uh, an economist, and put them all together to solve a problem. They all think very differently, and the one stimulates the other They've got to have enough knowledge of the other's field to understand it. But then once they really understand and respect each other, progress can be very dramatic, provided you've got that complete mix of, of, of backgrounds. Absolutely. I suppose it brings me on to the question of, of how you would perceive us to have been a successful innovation center. And I think some of our thinking around cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary work is right on the mark, right? And I think we're on a good trajectory. Already, Vitz has been innovating and produced a number of innovators like yourself, and we're very proud to have you as a Vitzy. But I guess the question is, how would, you, how would you measure success for us if you were to try to convey what you think the metrics would be for success? Well, one metrics I would say not to use is number of research papers you, you, <laughs> you're writing. Uh, but maybe to, to get there, but the number of research pages, papers in innovation is about as relevant as how many cups of coffee you drink in the morning. It's of no relevance whatsoever. What is relevant, and any way you can really measure it, the best way is how many jobs have you created? How many uh, good paying jobs for, uh, for your local folks have you, have you, have you generated? Another measure which is not nearly as good is number of patents that have been uh, issued on, on the topic. Not as good because it's, 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 some of them, people can file patents just for the sake of filing patents. But it's how many successes have you had? Uh, what I found was very stimulating, and, and hopefully Woods can do this, once you had a name and people were recognizing that you could solve problems, they came to you with their problems. And that was very stimulating. People come to you with a problem from industry, and they say, we're stuck, can, we, can you solve this? And most of the time, we could. 
because you looked at it from a totally different attitude. Very often they had defined the problem incorrectly. Uh, you defined it correctly and you solved the problem. Uh, or you had done something similar or one of your colleagues had. And this was very stimulating and very stimulating for another reason in, in that if, you, if someone had come to you with a problem and you solved it, the success was immediate. One area that I found very difficult to work with was, and it, it's, I, it happened to me a few times, but it's very common in a university environment. Someone comes up with a great solution and they look for the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and they spend a career looking for the problem that their solution can solve. And that's soul destroying because it may or may not be there. On the other hand, if you look for a real problem that's out there and you solve it, the financial return can be much, much quicker. Absolutely. I think on, on that note, I'm thinking about the Tlotlo, our senior program manager, and you know the things that they've done in the, what was previously the TMC, which is now being absorbed into the WIC, and the incredible innovations that they have at low cost really produced um, in terms of solving real industry problems. And Timolo Hong, around incubating problem solvers for, for industry. And I think we, we're into a very exciting time and some of the wisdom that you've imparted tonight will be, you know, a bit of a, the light bulb image is no longer up, so I won't use that, a bit of a North Star for us here at WITS. And Dr. Fine, I mean, I can't express my gratitude. Um, I'm very proudly the Angela and David Fine Chair in Innovation at WITS. Uh, and it is, And I think a lot of the things that you've said resonated with me through my academic career um, personally because I was still trying to, I suppose, find a home for my, my type of personality. And really, the Innovation Center has created that opportunity for our research community, which is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily exciting moment. And that is thanks to Zeb Landlin and, and Barry. And on that note, I want to thank you for everything and for let me Let me add one, one more yes, thing, please. which is a very important characteristic. I'm sorry. Um, an innovator is going to, people are going to say, you're crazy, you're nuts, uh, it'll never work. And they have to have the resilience to um, refute that. And, it, and people will knock them down pretty hard. So they've had to had hard knocks and recover from them. It's, it's, um, I've seen people around me innovate, get knocked down, and I can't deal with this, and they get out of the field. It, it can take a while. And uh, that drive to, no, I'm right, I'm going to make this happen, and uh, is, 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 a, is, is an important uh, aspect. The, sort of the last thing I wanted to mention, in, sort of in my perspective as I read about it, many experts in the field are known for one or two major things they did, inventions. They, they're experts, they know the field well, many of them are Nobel, Nobel laureates, and they typically, if you read how they made their great discoveries, by accident, serendipity, uh, and they were brilliant enough to figure out what went wrong, and that was their work. I found there was so much fun in solving problems that it became almost like a addiction to, to a drug. I got the, the high again, gee, I solved that problem. And I couldn't wait to get to the next one, and the next one. And it became something I, I couldn't satisfy. I just wanted to have more and more. And so, you know, as, as you mentioned, this afternoon, my, my background, I've done many different things, but they were all fun. <laughs>